All right, it's 7:05 Eastern Time. Let's get started. 现在是七点零五，我们可以开始我们的讲座了。So hi everyone, bonsoir tout le monde. 大家晚上好。Welcome to my North American Competition Open Course, hacking the 2019 to 2020 North American Math Competition using the big data and machine learning technologies. 那么欢迎大家呢来到我的北美数学竞赛的公开课讲座。今天呢。我们将会使用大数据和机器学习的方法，为大家分析二零一零到二零二零、二零一九到二零二零年度北美数学竞赛的发展趋势。So bienvenue à la cour aujourd'hui. Dans ce cours ce soir, je vais parler quelque chose pour les examens mathématiques au Canada et aux États-Unis. The language will be pretty much in English for today's presentation, and you might have some Chinese translations during my lecture from time to time. Now, I do understand we have some parents and students coming from Quebec, so French might be easier for them basically to understand. However, because the North American contest is especially for Canada and for the United States, so English is the dominant language. So therefore, we choose English as the presentation language today. If you do have some problems understanding English, you can let me know. I can do some translations afterwards. 那么今天的讲座语言呢，主要是英语为主。那么呢，我会做一些中文的翻译。呃，我也明白呢，有一些家长和同学来自 Quebec， 可能呢法语呢更加熟悉一点。嗯，但是呢，这个我们的北美数学竞赛更多的是针对于美国和加拿大 overall 的一个数学竞赛，所以呢，英文呢是一个 dominant 一个主导的语言。那么在今天的讲座中呢，我会主要使用英文。那么时不时呢，会做一些中文的翻译。如果你确实存在一些问题，理解英文的话呢，大家可以在群中反映。那么事后呢，我会为大家呢提供一些 translation. Alors, comme je dis, malheureusement, toutes les examens sont en anglais seulement. Alors, les lectures aujourd'hui est en anglais. Euh, et si vraiment vous avez des questions ou problèmes de me comprendre, dis-moi, je vais faire quelque chose. All right. So, to introduce myself, my name is Alex. I'm a coach. In the U.S. and Canadian math competition, we all know that the 2019 to 2020 math competitions are pretty much around the corner. So, in order to help you guys do some preparations for the upcoming examinations, I have arranged this open course, pretty much focused on answering some of the most commonly asked questions by the students and parents. So, hopefully, by answering all these questions, it's going to give you guys a little bit heads up. And help you guys during the U.S. and the Canadian math competition preparation process. So let's get started. As you can see here, this is the syllabus of today's presentation. So in today's presentation, we're going to be ans answering five major questions. So why we like to choose the North American math competition, and how we're going to understand. The North American Math Competition. Is there a curriculum for the 2019 for the 2020 Math Competition? And the fourth part is the data tells the real story, which is actually the major important part in our presentation. We're going to show you guys how to use the big data analysis and machine learning technology to abstract out all the curriculum for the upcoming 2019 to 2019 to 2020 Math Competition. And also at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you guys a little bit hints for the upcoming math competitions. So let's get started. Let's go to the first section: Why we like to choose the North American math competition. So this is like a cliche question. Different parents and different students keep asking me the same question. Hey, Alex, I'm not a superstar, or my kid is not a superstar, especially not so good in mathematics. Why do I bother? Entering the math, like the math competition, do I need to put my time, or is totally a waste of time? And I do understand where those guys come from, and the reason why they're asking me such a question because they might have a stereotype for the math competition. So most of the stereotype actually come from like the Chinese math competition. I'll take my personal experience as an example. I have to say I did put a lot of efforts, especially in my high school period, to prepare for the math competition. For instance, when I was in grade ten, I actually finished up all the curriculum for the entire high school 
period. And for every single week, they're going to put more than 20 hours just to do an exercise or practice, so on and so forth. And all the way until the first half of my grade 12. I gotta say, for my case, it actually pays off. So I did a very good job in the mass competition, the Chinese mass competition. I went to like the Chinese mass competition camp and basically do a lot of very good competitions. So therefore, it helped me to get my entrance to the Tsinghua University. But I gotta say, in this process, it was very challenging and it was very time consuming. Mm -hmm. It basically jeopardized the study of my other courses. So to some degree, I got to say, this kind of a Chinese math competition is really a minority's game. However, today,我们现在生活在加拿大和美国,当我们看到这个北美数学竞赛的时候,应该却是完全不一样的一番风景。不但没有我们中国的数学竞赛这种阳春白雪,树枝高阁,油爆琵琶半遮面的景象,反而
you know, like I think for, for Chinese people and also for like the Canadian people, we should be very familiar with circus, right? We have and also in Canada, like Cirque du Soleil from, from Quebec, right? It's very famous. So 你要付出很多很多的努力 Well, on the contrary, if we see the North American mass competition, I'm going to make an analogy pretty much like a gymnastic. So with the a little bit stretch, a little bit exercise, so everyone, regardless of your age, regardless of your weight, you can all participate in the process. So that being said, means there's a big difference between the two exams. The Canadian one is more participating. The American one is more participating, while the Chinese one is more like very selective. All right. So this is actually the first reason why we need to participate for the North American mass competition. Well, the second reason is very, is very conspicuous as well. In order to get enrolled into the top tier universities in Canada and in the States, you either have to have a very good GPA, you need to have the community engagement, you need to have the research skills, and also you need to show the result from the high level competitive competition. Mass competition, physics competition, computer chemistry competition, they're all considered to be a very important factor in a university, especially the top tier university application process. And the third reason is that basically to participate in the North American mass competition is not only for the mass itself, it also helps students to grow up this critical thinking, and independent thinking, which is also extremely important in the latter phase of everyone's life. So this is basically a short and brief introduction saying that why we need to participate in the North American mass contests. Let's go to the second category. If we believe that it is important to participate in this exam, we need to have some understanding for those exams. So we need to understand our North American exams. There are some exams actually pretty much around the corner. The first one is the COMC. COMC stands for the Canadian Open Mathematics Challenge. It's actually an exam created by the Canadian Mathematical Society focus on a student younger than 19 years old. There are basically like four sec three sections in the COMC exams. So the top 50 students will be directly go to the CMO to basically participate for the Canadian Mass Olympia. And from 51 to 75 students, they had a second chance. They can take the Canadian Mathematical Olympia qualifying rebouchage. So this is more like a take-home exam. So you have some time to finish up the exam. So for this exam, it focuses more on the methodologies rather than the results, because you have like a, a more risk, a more decent time to finish the exam. So having the right answer is not exactly what you want. However, if you can have the very smart answer, and your answer can rectify or can reflect the most important mathematical thinking that will be exactly what the COMC is looking for. So if we do an analogy, the COMC is more like the AMI in the United States. It's a qualifying exam to the CMO. And by the way, I want to say, like, you know, our CMO at the Canadian Mass Olympia is actually very, it's actually very famous, very prestiged. You know, for Canada, even though we actually did a shitty job in the real, like the real Olympia games, but we actually did a very fancy, very decent job in the mass Olympia. So if you check the, the IMO ranking, Canada is ranking pretty high. Like the reason behind that is pretty conspicuous because we have like so many Chinese immigrants, there's so many talents, 
there are too many, so many well-qualified students coming from China, and they can basically participate in this exam and hoping to boost up the Canadians' ranking in the entire IMO ranking stage. So that is the COMC. The other one is the Euclid. Euclid is actually exam created by the University of Waterloo, Center of Education in Mathematics and Computing. So this exam is more targeting for the students of grade 12. But of course, if you're lower than grade 12, you're also welcome to participate in the exam. The Euclid exam is actually very well recognized by the Canadian and American universities. Especially, a lot of universities take the Euclid exam as a very important factor to determine the scholarships. Especially, Waterloo, I'll give an example. Waterloo would like to give the scholarship to a student who did a better job in the Euclid rather than another student who did a better job in AMC. Even though we know AMC is more complicated compared with Euclid, because Euclid per se is the brand of the Waterloo University, so therefore Waterloo University actually put a lot of emphasis for the Euclid exam. If you can do a very good job in the Euclid exam, you can have a wide variety of different majors you can choose from the University of Waterloo. So as here I indicated, there are some top very, I'll say like hot pot directions you can go for, like the computer science, like the computer engineering, software engineering, financial engineering. So all those majors, they are basically, a, they really favorite the student who can, did, who can do a very good job in the Euclid exam. And also, as you can see here, that this is actually statistics for the 2019 Euclid exam. You can see, you know, we have like more than 20,000 people coming all over the place, participate in the Euclid exam. We have a big chunk coming from Ontario and the second place is coming from BC. And also we have 8,000, almost like 8,500 8, students internationally. So that being said, Euclid is also a very well-recognized international exam. The third part I wanna say is like the AMC. AMC actually stands for the American Mathematics Competition. It's actually a series of examinations that focus on the problem solving skills and mathematical knowledge in junior and senior high school students. So AMC is not like only one exam. There are a series of exams. Normally what we are familiar with is the AMC 8, AMC 10 and 12. You still have the AME and the USAMO. However, the last two exams, you need to get an invitation. So not everyone can go to the exam automatically. You need to do a very good job in the AMC 10 and 12. Let's say 2.5% in AMC 10 and 5% in AMC 12. That will enable you or eligible you in order to go to the AME exam. And the USAMO is actually determined by your scores coming from AMC plus the AME, and then make the eligibility for the students to participate in the USAMO. Actually, there are three important changing points or say the turning points in the entire AMC history. The first one, as you can see, is the year 2012. Before the year 2012, there was only one AMC exam per year. So basically, if you miss one year, you're going to be waiting for the next year. However, after 2002, the AMC examining center realized passion from older students. So they basically split the exam into two parts, AMC A and AMC B. As long as you're passing the 5% or 2.5% entry criteria, you have the same bet to go to the AME exam. 刚才我们谈到的AMC A和B就是仅仅针对于北美的考生而言。那么中国的考生呢，实际上呢，每年的AMC也仅仅只有一次的机会。这个原因是这样的，因为每年AMC考试的时间恰逢中国的春节期间，
Okay, that's the case for the Chinese students. Well, that's actually the first change for the AMC history. You can see from two, from one exam, we basically split into two exams. Well, the second change, it might not be so conspicuous. It happened around the year 211. So after 211, the complexity of the AMC exam boost up significantly. They cover more concepts, more zhishidian in Chinese we say, more concepts. And even for the same concepts, the exam tend to test you deeper and deeper. I'll give a quick example like this. Before 2011, if we're talking about the geometry, AMC basically focused on some similarities and the basic, basic geometry principles. However, as long as after 2011, you're gonna find out very fancy theorems are well seen in this AMC exams, like the Ptolemy's theory, the Menelaus theory, the Sevas theory, and even the very complicated Stewart theorem. We never seen it before the 2011, but see it more and more often after 2011. Another example, as you can see, is that is that the number theory, which is a very important and very complicated part for the entire mass competition. Before 2011, they only test you some divisibility, prime numbers, composite numbers, or like the modular arithmetic, the basic, basic concepts for the mass competition. However, after 2011, FACMA's little principle, fundamental theorems of the arithmetic, Chinese remainder theory, and the older torsion function is becoming more and more popular in the mass competition. Yeah, just especially the Chinese remainder, because our lecture just to cover the Chinese remainder theory, this is actually a very, very important theory. You're going to see that very often in the mass competitions. You know, these days, you, you guys know like the trade war between, between the United States and China, right? So there's a lot of like Chinese companies, Chinese corporates were banned in the United States. But for now, it doesn't really ban the Chinese remainder theory. Chinese remainder theory is still very important in the AMC exam. At least for now, they don't find out like the US remainder theory to replace the Chinese remainder theory. I'll give an example to justify what I just mentioned. I took exam question from 2009 AMC 10B, question number 20. So you have like a triangle. So this triangle, they give you some size, AB equal to one, BC equal to two, and also AD is a bisector of the angle BAC. So the question asks you to determine what is the value for BD, right? So actually to solve the problem is fairly straightforward. You just have to use one single theorem, which is the bisector theorem. As long as you know the bisector theorem, you'll be able to solve it right away. So this is what you see before 2011. Let's have a look to see what happened after 2011. This is a question for 2016 AMC 10B, question number 19. If we do a comparison, the previous one was number 20, while this one is number 19. It's supposed to be a little bit easier compared with the previous one, right? However, it was not the case. So we don't have to go to like the really detail of the question. We can say that it basically give you a rectangle and give you some relationships for you to determine what is the ratio between PQ over EF. So in order to solve the problem, you have to add auxiliary lines, like I highlighted here. And instead of one, you have to add two auxiliary lines. You see the previous one, it doesn't really ask you to put any auxiliary lines. But for now, you have to put two auxiliary lines. And also you see the entire derivation process. You really need to put a lot of efforts to make sure you can finish all the problem within three minutes. Because we know AMC, roughly speaking, you should have finished each problem within three minutes. So in order to do this, you need to have a very good understanding for the entire theorems in order to help you finish in time. That was actually the second change for the AMC history. The third change, in the AMC history is the exam we just finished in February, the 2019 AMC exam. According to all the statistic data, it indicates that the 2019 AMC exam is one of the most complicated exam 
in the entire AMC history. I'm going to give you a data analysis. Like I said, I, I'm going to keep using data to justify what I'm saying. So this is data I got from the AMC statistics. So this is official data you can download from the AMC website. I basically plot out, plot out this data into such a graph. This is the score distribution for all the participating students. The one in black, you can see that's actually the distribution for the year 2019, while the line in red is it for the year 2018. As you can see, this actually follows like a Gaussian distribution. And you can see that there are not so many students get a zero score and not so many students get a full score. There will be a, a big percentage of students who are pretty much distributed in the middle, roughly from 40 all the way to 80. A quick observation can tell that in the year 2018, especially in the red line, there are more students getting a higher score for the middle range, 40 around 80, while in the year 2019, this number has been reduced significantly. So that being said, it's very conspicuous that the AMC exam has been complicated, has been making more and more complicated. And the reason behind it is very straightforward as well, because more and more students participating in the AMC exam. Since there are more and more competitors all over the world, the AMC exam center can do nothing but increasing the complicity of the AMC exam. Okay, so that's actually answer the second question. We understand our mass competition. The third question people keep asking me that, is there a curriculum for the 2019 to 2020 mass competition? You know, for our Chinese students, whenever we go to like the mass competition or any kind of exams, we're always going to be asking for three questions, like, 有没有考纲? Uh, uh, something like this, right? Which is quite understandable. But for the AMC or for like the Canadian exam, for instance, do we have a curriculum that can help us do some preparations? I want to give you a, a little bit an example for this. For instance, we know trigonometry is a very important part in any kind of mass competitions, right? And the trigonometry, especially the trigonometry identities, it has like so many different formulas. And how many formulas I need to remember? I just remember something like this. It's only the basic, basic one. I see the sine, the cosine, the tangent, the cotangent relationship. Or I have to remember something like right. Way more formulas for me to go. So this is actually a question, it's actually a very intuitive question that asked by all the students and also the parents as well. So to remember or not to remember, it's a question. And also how many I need to remember is another question. So to answer you guys the question, do we have a curriculum for the 2019 to 2020 mass competition exam? The short answer is no. I'm sorry, there's no curriculum. I know it's bad, even for like the Chinese Gaokao. So around Gaokao, there's a Chinese Gaokao test. So there's no use. But in the next year, it will give a test. Okay. However, for all the mass competitions, the American one, the Canadian one, they never ever have any guide or curriculum released by the exam center. And actually, there are two reasons behind it. The first reason is very intuitive because the purpose of all those mass competition is to find out the talents for the, either the Canadian MO or the USAMO. As long as the exam center released the curriculum or guideline, the student is gonna do the preparation explicitly focused on the guideline. So it's gonna be a little, a little bit against the purpose, right? Where the AMC exams, because they're trying to find out all the talents rather than the student who basically follow the guy, the guideline, follow the curriculum and do the preparation. That's actually a very intuitive reason. Well, the second reason is that, because like I mentioned, more and more students were participating in the exam. So the complicity of the mm -hmm. exam has been pushed up gradually by gradually. If they have to give you a guideline and one day, someday, they have to create a question 
and the solution of the question falls outside the guideline. So the AMC or the Canadian the Waterloo Examination Center is going to be questioned by the students and the parents. But why are you going to have something outside your guideline? So that's basically the reason where, or like, like the reason why we never have a guideline for the Canadian and, mass, and American mass competitions. It was never released before, and it's not going to be released in the future. But do we need a curriculum? The answer is absolutely yes, right? Because, you know, we have too many things to do. And of course, we need to have a curriculum in order to be more target in the exam. So like I summarized, there are actually three study patterns that basically scattered for all, like, uh, for all our students. The first pattern is that your knowledge, like the first one on the left, your knowledge is way more wider compared with the exam curriculum. It means whatever the exam asks you, you have already known. So I call it, this is like a God study pattern. Unfortunately, in the real life, I don't think a lot of students, they can do this because math is only part of their life. You still have all the other stuff to take care of. It. Well, the second part is your knowledge is exactly the same thing as the exam curriculum. So whatever you know is exactly will be tested during the math competition or whatever it competition. So that one, what we call it is like the high efficiency study pattern. So they test what you know, and you know what has to be tested. Well, the third one is a little bit unfortunate. Your knowledge and the exam curriculum basically has like a random distribution. You just basically cross your fingers and, you know, pray for the best. So we call this is like a random study pattern. Of course, what we want is to having the high efficient study pattern. So the million dollar question is, how can I get the curriculum for the 2019 and the 2020 mass competition? Well, the traditional way will probably will say that using the experience, right? You're probably gonna talk to a, like a 200 year old teacher saying that, you know, based on my experience, I thought blah, 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 blah should be important. But there's like pretty like mysterious, right? And you have really have no idea why they come into such a conclusion. So it's pretty much like astrology, right? It's really out of our control. So this is not exactly what we want. Do we have another solution in order to get what we want? The answer is absolutely yes. We can use the data to let the data tell the real story. You know, these days, you know, our world is actually driven by the data, right? Not only for the mass competition, but also the job market, the stock market, even the lottery. Right? People try to do a lot of an like analysis to figure out what's gonna happen in the future. So big data is like a buzzword, everyone talk about it. So you know what actually, cause I do big data in everyday life. I know that big data, you know, the most important thing for the big data analysis is not the algorithm. The algorithm is fairly straightforward. And even though there's a little bit of improvement, but it's not so dramatic. But well, the most, most important thing for the data analysis is you need to have the data. As long as you got the data, you are the king. And actually, you know, for this AMC exam or like the, uh, our, our Canadian exam, we can see that it is very reasonable that we can do some uh, data analysis in order to figure out what is going to be the next trend. From the mathematics perspective, you know, for certain type of mass competition, they will always have some concepts which are important, which they like to examine from time to time, right? This is not going to change in the short future. So as long as you can have a collection of all the existing database, it's, it's going to be very easy for you to predict what is going to happen in the future. And same thing applies from the psychologist's perspective. You know, the exams, the North American exams, they are not created by computers, right? They are created by human beings. You know, human beings, they have a momentum. Human beings, they're pretty much terrified, even though they never admit. But they always tend to believe what they always believe. So as long as you can find out what they have done before, you have no older existing steps, it's very easy for you to predict 
what will be their next step. So that being said, as long as we can do analysis for all the North American exams by using the existing data, we can create a model. And by using the model, doing analysis, we can predict what's going to happen in the future and what is the trend for the next few years. So this, this is quite, quite doable. So I'll take the AMC contest as an example. You know what, because AMC has a longer history. Like I said, the more data you have, the more accurate your model will be, a better result this analysis will generate. Because AMC has a way longer history compared with the Canadian exams, and that's the reason why I take AMC as an example. So as a step number one, you need to, re you need to achieve all the official data, all the official exams from the AMC website. You know, the AMC exam actually started from the very, from very, very beginning is from the year 1950. That was the annual high school contest only in the New York States. All the way after 20, after 50 years, whenever it goes to 2000, it splits into the AMC 10 and the AMC 12, which are the pretty well-known exams across the world. And these days, it already has a history of more of roughly 70 years. So I have already retrieved all these exams, all the exam data from the AMC website and some other channels. So this has actually helped me finish my first step, achieve the official data from all the exams. Well, the second way is you're gonna find out the right programming language and the processing package. I suggest you guys to use Python because Python is very powerful talking about different data processing. You can use the TensorFlow, you can use the SciPy, NumPy in order to do the process. Of course, you can also use R language. It's the same thing. As long as you can find out the right package, you'll be able to process your coding. The most important package you need to download is the natural language processing because every single question is actually written in the English language. The computer has to understand the comp this English language and then classify them into certain categories. So you need to download the NLP, Natural Language Passing, Natural Language Processing package into your code and make sure your code can basically process all the languages. And then you're gonna process all your data and push them into the database. And then you're gonna do some machine learning. Because you have so much data, you don't really have to classify all the data one by one. You can start your analysis by using only 30% of your data. You basically tell this computer, okay, for this question, what kind of concepts the question tested, so on and so forth. And then after a certain amount of practice, the computer will use the deep learning package to understand basic like the drills and how to do another analysis, analysis for the new coming questions. So this training process can actually stop after 30%. And for the next 60% to 70%, you can let a computer to do the machine learning itself. And also, after, of course, there's a lot of data mining process to make sure you correct like the right data. You have to analyze to the, as generated like the matrix for all those keywords. And also at the end of the day, you need to use the data virtualization technologies to put them into a graph and show you the distribution for all the concepts for the North American exams. So this is like a basically natural language processing workflow. You can download it from whatever website and most of them are actually open source. So if you are uh, pretty interested in the computer programming or if your parents are doing the computer engineering, this should be very, under this should be very easy to wrap it up and figure out how to do the process. Okay. Let's have a look at the results. So this is my result after the big data analysis. So this figure actually concludes all the AMC exam from the year 1950 all the way to the year 2019. As you can see here, the AMC covers 217 different concepts for this 70 years. And this 217 concepts has been distributed into four major categories, algebra, geometry, counting the probabilities, and also number theory. 
a quick anal a quick uh, explanation for the graph. As you can see, the different circles, right? As long as you just, you can see the circle is big, it means this concept is very important. AMC tested many, 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 many times. The weight of this concept is very important. Well, on the contrary, if you see N10, this concept is fairly slow. It is fairly small. It actually means that this one is not as that much important as the previous one. So if you only have a limited time, I suggest you guys can basically focus on the big concepts, the big circles, because they are the most, most important AMC concepts in the mass competition. So basically in my lecture, so here in this presentation, I give like the a variable names, A1, A2, all the way to A17. But in my lecture, I'm gonna give you guys more explanation. What does A17 stands for? What does A14 stands for? Okay, this guy, this is more to give you guys uh, like an idea how to do the analysis and generalize such, generate such like a mapping for all the concepts. So moving forward, whenever I have such a concepts mapping, it can actually tell me two important things. The first important thing is, it's gonna help me do a prediction. We can see the concept weight are actually changing over the years. So here I actually give you three different graphs. You can do a little bit analysis. The first graph actually give you all the concepts from 2000 to 2006. The second one is from 2007 to 2013. And the third one is to 2014 to 2019. As you can see from here that the A7, you see the A17, I'm sorry, A17. As you can see, the size of A17 is relatively small at the very beginning and then become bigger in the second graph and become even bigger in the last graph. A17 actually stands for the trigonometry identities. So that being said, in the last 20 years, the trigonometry identity is becoming more and more important in the AMC exam. Because there's a lot of reason, maybe because the order changed, because different exam order, they might have some preference, or maybe their internal guideline has been changed. Of course, we have no way to know that, however, this big data analysis already reveals that the trigonometry identity, the corresponding weight has been increased from 21.84%, from 48%, all the way to 30.42%. And same thing applies for the A17, A14, which is the inequality. Inequality is also relatively small previously and become bigger in the middle and become even bigger at the very end. So that one being said means inequality is also becoming more and more Im important in our days. And that's part of the reason why in my current lectures, I put more and more emphasis for the inequality and the trigonometry identities. Because students keep complaining, how come we spend so much time on something so complicated? I like to do something easier. I, yes, I do understand you. However, the analysis already indicates the inequality and the trigonometry identity has already becoming more and more important. So therefore, we need to put more emphasis. And same thing applies for the Euler's principle. As you can see, it becoming more and more important. So these are the concepts becoming more and more important. And also there are some concepts becoming less and less important. So as I blurred I mosaic most of the other paragraphs in order to make it more conspicuous, as you can see, there are some patterns, there are some concepts is no longer important as it was. So basically understanding what is more important gradually by gradually, what is less important gradually by gradually, is gonna really help you to leverage your efforts when you're doing the preparation. This is actually the first discovery retrieved by this big data analysis. Well, the second discovery is we can find out the most important concepts for all the North American mass competitions. Well, the first slides actually give us the statistics for the Canadian contest, the Euclid on the top and the COMC in the bottom. And I actually do the analysis back from 1998 for Euclid and 1996 for COMC, all the way to this year, 2018. A quick observation, as you can see that from the Euclid ranking, the first one is the area and the volume. 
The second one is also geometry. The third one is trigonometry. The fourth one is similarity. It looks like Euclid really, really put a lot of emphasis on the geometry part. And the same thing if you go to the COMC, the geometry is number one, circle and properties. Number two is the area and the volume. Number three is the linear equation from algebra. And number four is the similarity from geometry. Also, very similar. It also focuses a lot on the geometry. And the reason actually behind it is very conspicuous because the COMC and Euclid, they were actually examined by the same exam center in University of Waterloo. So exactly the same amount of people, same group of people, they did a basic create the same exam for different two examinations, but it's like the same people, the same momento. So this is actually one find out. The second find out, you can see that actually different with the American exams, the Canadian exam actually focus a lot on the geometry, especially for the COMC, it focus a lot in the geometry. And the reason behind that is very conspicuous because for the Canadian exams, we don't go for the multiple tries, right? We have to ask somebody to show the work. As long as you show the work, geometry is actually a very good candidate. Like the way how you analyze the problem and present your work is actually something very testable for the geometry problems. And if you want to do a very good job for the Canadian exam, it's always very important for you to show your work. For the AMC, you just choose A, B, C, D, E, and that's it. Well, for the Canadian exams, you need to show your work, show your reasoning. That is actually one of the most important things you want to do for the Canadian exams. Well, like I said, comparing with Amy, COMC focus more on the geometry, and also it is not so important for, I mean, for the COMC, it's not so focused on the counting and probabilities. So based on my analysis, uh, actually my ranking list out all those concepts, but this one is only the top four. As you can see a ranking for the, the counting and the probabilities, COMC is only 15, while the AME is top three. So that's actually the difference between the two. And that makes sense because counting and probability is easier for them to go for A, B, C, D, E question, while it's kind of difficult to go for like the subjective question. And also in the IM mode, we don't really focus that much in the counting and probability these days. So focus more on the geometry is actually very important. Well, the second slide shows the statistics for the American exams. You can see the AMT, AMC 10 on the top and the AMC 12 at the bottom. As you can see that AMC is actually more well distributed, evenly distributed. The first one is geometry. The second one is counting and probability. The third one is the integer from the number theory. The fourth one is the linear algebra. Well, the AMC 12, actually you have the area and volume for the number one. The logarithm, you see logarithm is more important for AMC 12 versus AMC 10. And also inequality, which you don't see quite a lot in AMC 10, but quite often in AMC 12 and also the factorization for the number theory. And the reason behind that is that because in the 1960s, the junior high school, like the, what is called, like the textbook of the US junior high schools has been rectified. And they actually cancel out a lot of geometry parts. And that's the reason why these days, the United States, the geometry is not as strong as the Canadian geometry. These actually can be rectified by the data analysis from the IMO, IMO results. The USA team actually failed more in the geometry problems, while the Canadian team is actually pretty good at a geometry problem. And also you can see that there's a lot of inequality and uh, logarithm actually introduced into the AMC 12. Like I said, that's the reason why I keep a lot of emphasis for the inequality in my lectures in these days. And also there's a very important thing I like to point it out here as well. That is the AMC 20 and AMC 12. Previously, you know, for every year, they might have some duplicate questions, but the number is not so significant. Always maybe for two questions, five questions maximum. However, 
from the year 2019. For AMC 10A and A and AMC 12A, AMC 10B, AMC 12B, the overlap question boosts up into 13 questions. It used to be three to five, and now it goes to 13. You know, the entire AMC is only 25 questions in total. So that being said, means the differences between the AMC 10 and the AMC 12 is becoming, you know, more and more lesser and lesser. And the, like the line between the two exams are becoming more and more blurred. So people keep asking me, how can I, I need to go to AMC 10 or I need to go to AMC 12? These days, it's no longer a big question because over 50% of the questions are the same for AMC 10 and AMC 12. That is also a big trend saying that these two exams are becoming more and more similar and more and more difficult. That's the second thing what I can find out from the big data analysis. The third thing we can find out from the big data analysis is something, you know, when you get confused, when you get stuck in the mass competition, for instance, right, you, you're in the middle of mass competition, you really have no idea for a question, you're totally blind, and you have to guess. For instance, you have to guess. The big data analysis actually help us to do a guess because all the historical data analysis already indicates what is the preferred AMC answer. So these are the three questions I keep asking my students. If in the middle of an exam, you're dealing with a periodic function and you need to find out what is the period of the function, but you really have no idea what a period is. So what number you need to guess? You can't randomly guess one or two or three. Actually, there is an AMC number. There is a period. If you go back for all the AMC exams, that period has the highest, the highest of probability. If you want to do a guess, choose that number. Another question I keep asking my student is that P is a prime number. Let's say in the AMC exam, they ask you P is a prime number. So please determine the value of P. If you really have no idea what P is, what number you need to guess for the p-value. So this is not on top of your head. There must be some based on analysis on the historical AMC exams. And also, if you really have no idea, you don't even know what a question is talking about, and you have to choose A, B, C, D, one of the answer from them, what answer you need to choose. In China, we basically choose C. We see, we see C is always the right answer. But trust me, C is not the right answer for the AMC. If you check for all the historical data for the AMC exam, you're gonna find out one of the options from A, B, C, D, E. One of them has significantly high probability compared with the other guess. So what is that answer? So these are like the big data, this is like the side product that big data analysis can bring us. Of course, I don't want you guys to keep guessing in AMC because you, I really want to guess to know from A to Z, right? But you know, she's gonna happen, right? It's like Morphe's law, shit happens. So whenever you really find a problem, you really have no idea what to do, there is a problem. There is a kind of way for you to, it's kind of like the last insurance, right? Help you to pick up something more likely to be yes than likely to be no. So if you do the big data analysis, you'll be able to figure out what a value is, okay? So the last but not least, I'd like to give you guys a little bit of hint for the upcoming 2019 to 2020 North American mass competition exams, how are we gonna do the preparation in the, in the next uh, few months? First one I want you guys to do is classify all the problems one by one. You know, I have some students, they keep telling me that, hey, Alex, I finished like so many exam sheets from like, I don't know, from 2000 all the way to 2019. And, but still, I still have no idea what is my weakness, what is my strongness, something like that. I told him that, okay, I understand you only finished all the exam sheets, exam paper, but do you classify all the problems one by one? Maybe you always failed for the, give an example, polynomial. You always failed for polynomial, but sometimes if like this year, 2019, it doesn't really care polynomial too much, it did a good job. But 2017, it focused a lot on the polynomial, so therefore it did a shitty job. If that's the case, then you need to figure out what is your weakness. So my first suggestion is that always try to classify your problems by using different concepts. 
So those concepts are not randomly created by yourself or by imagination. It's actually based on the big data analysis. That one lists out all these 200 concepts and how you classify all the problems into these 200 concepts. That's actually step number one you need to do for the upcoming mass computation. Well, the second thing I want to do is that, you know, algebra problem. Algebra is always like something complicated and they're going to give you some tough questions in the last five questions. You know, sometimes a complicated algebra problem can sometimes have a more straightforward geometry solution and vice versa. A complicated geometry problem might also have a more straightforward algebra solution. So as the example I show you guys here, uh, because today this is not a lecture focused on how to do the problem, it's more focused on the methodology, right? So we're not going to go to the problem uh, analysis tool dip. So basically you have a, such a real number pair, it basically have two equations. If you want to solve this equation from the algebra way, of course, you're going to do an analysis for the x because the x has the absolute value. Another analysis for y, positive, negative, and also another analysis for x absolute value minus y absolute value. You're basically going to do analysis for eight different times. That's going to take forever for sure. You won't be able to finish them within three minutes, like we just mentioned. However, if you solve the problem by using the geometry way, because it's fairly straightforward for you to realize the second equation actually indicates two lines. And these two lines are actually symmetric for four different coordinates, right? So, and also the first equation underlines another line. As long as you plot out these two lines, it's very easy for you to tell right away, okay, there are three intersection points for the three, for these two, different graphs. So using the graph, using the geometry way to solve the algebra problem is always something, you know, they can always bring something surprise, surprise, right? Give you a little bit of surprise. Next one, a quick and dirty solution is always good enough. You know, AMC exam is actually a multiple choice. So they really doesn't care how you get your answer. If you're good at throwing a dice, and every time you can make sure you get a right dice answer, no problem, directly go to Amy. No question will be asked. So that being said means whenever we're trying to solve a complicated problem, we don't really have to be very, very rigorous. As long as we got a shortcut answer, we're good to go. I'll give an example, something like this. This is a question from AMC 12A, 2017. A set of S is constructed as follows. To begin, S contains two numbers, 0 and 10. Repetitively, as long as possible, if X is an integer root of some polynomial, blah, 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 4 and greater than 1, all of those coefficient AI are elements from S, then X is put back into S. So basically saying that you're going to use the elements from the set to create a polynomial. As long as this polynomial has an integer root, you're gonna put back this integer root into this original set. So now your original set is getting bigger and bigger, right? So gradually by gradually, when there's no more elements can be added into S, then how many elements does S have? So that's the question. First of all, I'd like to show you guys the official solution given by the AMC. So this is like the official solution. Trust me, not to say you can think about a question by yourself. I'll just ask you to write down the question, line by line, write, copy the question within, 30, within like three minutes. This is not going to happen, right? Still remember every single question, you at most have three minutes to finish them all so many answers. Just basically writing them down is going to take more than three minutes. So this is impossible for you to solve within the three minutes. Well, my solution is always a quick and dirty solution. So my solution goes like this. Let's say you have already got such a polynomial which contains 0 and 10 from the original set. So basically you're going to write this polynomial into something like this. Is that right? 
So at the very beginning, zero, of course, you can't put zero into any of this coefficient. You can only put it in the middle. So I put it here. So this is the polynomial. I'm just doing a very quick analysis. You can see that if I put the 10 from right, from left to right, and do a quick factorization for the left hand side, you're going to see that x times another polynomial is equal to minus 10. So that being said, x must be a factor of minus 10. So what you have to do is you just basically list out all the factors of minus 10. Positive, negative 1, 2, 5, 10. Don't forget, there's a 0 because 0 is actually given by the question originally. So that being said, you have 11 data in total. You should choose E as the option. So you see, if you can go for this solution, it's actually a lot more straightforward comparing you just basically no. do a hard, hard calculation, so on and so forth. So that's actually the third hint I like to give you guys. A quick and dirty solution is always good enough. The fourth hint I like to give you guys is the calculating and thinking. You know, this is actually all the topic for the entire mathematics. Thinking and calculation, you can't have it both. In the same question, if you think more, then you don't have to calculate too much and vice versa. If you can calculate a little bit more, then you don't have to think too much. The same thing applies for the computing, for our these days computing, right? Like you can do the thinking, because thinking per se is actually very expensive. Well, calculation, calculation is kind of cheap. I use the word double quotation mark. Calculation is cheap. So as long as you do a lot of practice, you can do a calculation fairly quick. So what I suggest to you guys is you need to identify yourself. You are more a thinker or you are more a calculator. If you're good at thinking, just try to think more. Well, to reconcile, to, to basically fade out a little bit of ca uh, calculation. Or the other way around, if you're very good at calculation, you know some problems. If you don't want like to think too much, you can always try to calculate as much as possible. So that being said, it's another way for us to basically understand how to use your advantage during the mass competition. Calculation or thinking. You need to identify. You know your bet. You know yourself better than anyone else and figure out what type of person you are. Last but not least, no panic for the long questions. This is a problem I got from AMC 12, question number 21. It's a long, long, long question. Sometimes people just get blow, blown away whenever they see the long question. They're scared, they're terrified. But actually, you know what? The solution is only one liner. You just have to calculate the least common multiple of five different numbers. Because like I said, for every single question, you should basically finish them within three minutes. So the more time you spend doing the reading, maybe the less time you will spend on the solving the problem itself. So basically just try to do a balance. Whenever you see a long, long question, no panic and try to understand the whole point of the question. And maybe the answer is fairly straightforward. So that being said, we have already introduced the five important hints for the upcoming 2019 for 2020 AMC exam. So hopefully what I say is, I, can, I mean, what I just said can give you guys a little bit hint and help you guys do some preparation for the upcoming 2019 and 2020 North American competition. So thank you guys for participating in our open course today. And I wish you every guy, every student, good luck for the upcoming exams. Thank you guys. I'll see you guys next time. Bye now. Oh. Oh, we in quiet.